Good morning and welcome to this time of worship at Home Moravian Church, whether you're worshiping here in the pews with us or whether you're worshiping online or via the radio, we welcome you. If you're here in the pews, we invite you to sign the friendship registers. Uh, if you're online, sign the friendship register. We're still working on getting that technology fixed. We've had a little problem with it, but we do hope you'll sign in because we will see those sign-ins eventually. We celebrate today the festival of August 13th, marking an experience of the Holy Spirit that in 1727 gave birth to what we call the renewed Moravian Church. And we mark this occasion as we do other special days in the Moravian Church with a service of love feast. So we're all in for good time this morning. And as always, we're deeply grateful for the deaners who bring our love feast to us and also for Tony the coffee maker so be sure to thank all of them today when you see them after worship. Unfortunately, Associate Pastor Reverend Andrew Heil is sick today. I can't be with us. We do miss him and we'll pray for his swift recovery. This morning we pray for the comfort uh, for the family and friends of our sister Stephanie Crumpler. Stephanie was received yesterday morning into the more immediate presence of Jesus Christ. And her funeral service will be in Raleigh where she has been living with family members but her burial will be in God's Acre this coming Saturday, August 20th at 2 p.m. And let us pause now to remember her in prayer by singing the funeral chorales found in the booklets in your pews. We'll sing pages 3 and 12. now gather our hearts for worship as we listen to our prelude.
Holy Spirit, Lord of love, who descended from above, gifts of blessing to bestow on your waiting church below. Once again, in love draw near to your servants gathered here from our bright baptismal day. You have led us on your way. Let us stand and sing.
Let us pray together the Moravian blessing found in your bulletin. Come, Lord Jesus, our guest to be, and bless these gifts bestowed by thee. Amen.
The gospel text assigned by the lectionary today is from Luke 12, verses 49 through 56. And Jesus is speaking. I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already ablaze. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what constraint I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say it is going to rain, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? When it comes to sermon texts, I do like a challenge. <laughs> but when I saw the gospel reading assigned by the lectionary for this low feast Sunday, I wondered if this wasn't more challenge than we could bear. After all, today we celebrate the Moravian festival of August 13th. We celebrate how our fractious ancestors in Herrenhut, Germany, through the intervention of the Holy Spirit, overcame their divisions and in the process discovered Love Feast. This is the day when we want to be celebrating unity, not division. Rather than grapple with Luke 12, where Jesus declares that he did not come to bring peace to the earth, we'd prefer to flip back to Luke 2, where peace on earth is the song of the angels. And yet, because we read Luke, Jesus' challenge should not take us by surprise. In the same chapter where angels sing about peace, the old man Simeon in the temple holding the infant Jesus declares this child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed. <clears throat> Heck, in the very first chapter of Luke, Mary, mother of Jesus, sings that the mighty one has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. If you think that is a recipe for peace on earth, you are not thinking about how the rich and powerful will feel about that. From the beginning of his ministry, Jesus disrupts and divides, cutting a wide swath from chapters 4 through 11 with provocative preaching that makes the crowds want to throw him off a cliff and with deeds that either cannot be done, such as stopping wind and waves, or must not be done, such as reinterpreting Sabbath codes. He divides himself from his own family. When told that his, mothers and his mother and brothers are looking for him, he declares, my mother and brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. <clears throat> Why all this division from the one we hail as the Prince of Peace? Because on the other side of division is commitment. And commitment is what Jesus has been talking about since he set his face toward Jerusalem. That was a commitment that would end his life. To commit to that path meant to turn away from all other paths, as it were, dividing himself from all other possibilities. Every serious, life-changing commitment involves division. Commit to marry, and you divide yourself not only from all other potential romantic relationships, but from all the versions of yourself that you would have been in those relationships. Commit to expert level sport or art or to medical school or to anything requiring thousands of hours of study and practice and you divide yourself from all the other things you might have done with those hours, a lot of which you would really have enjoyed. Commit to stop drinking 
and you divide yourself not only from alcohol, but from certain people, some of whom you really love, and a lot of places, some of which may have been your favorites. If all these commitments involve division, why would not the same be true when we commit to the kingdom of God, when we strive as Jesus does, urges us to do, for the Father's kingdom? As C.S. Lewis has written, you cannot take all luggage with you on all journeys. On one journey, even your right hand and your right eye may be among the things you have to leave behind. The religious refugees in 18th century Hernhut knew about leaving things behind. They had left their homeland, some of them fleeing at night because leaving their homeland was against the law, and settled on the estate of Count Zinzendorf in Saxony so that they might worship God according to their convictions. The first were from Moravia in what is today the Czech Republic. Others were from various parts of Germany. All the residents of Hernhut had divided themselves from their former lives because of a commitment to Christ, but not necessarily a commitment to each other. And so they struggled with a different kind of division. While they shared a commitment to Christ, they brought a variety of ideas and practices, every one of which was an occasion for passionate argument. Zinzendorf biographer John Weinlich says that more than once, the infant village was near shipwreck on the rocks of discord. Count Zinzendorf worked assiduously to heal and strengthen relationships in the community through intensive personal conversations and Bible studies. And his efforts bore some fruit. And on May 12, 1727, the residents of Herrenhut signed a brotherly agreement in which they committed to a set of rules for living in community. And really, a summary of the whole set of rules is rule two. Herrenhut must remain in a constant bond of love with all children of God belonging to the different religious persuasions. They must judge none, enter into no disputes with any, nor behave themselves unseemly toward any, but rather seek to maintain among themselves the pure evangelical doctrine, simplicity, and grace. The signing of the Brotherly Agreement led to a summer of religious revival and, according to tradition, the development of real community in Hernhut. Weinlich says that previous discords were dissolved. But were they? Maybe it was like dissolving jello, where it seems that despite all your stirring, some of the powder just swirls around and swirls around till it settles as a solid residue in the bottom. If all the previous discords had really been dissolved, the Herrenhut community would not have needed another stir. Those who partook of the communion on August 13th experienced what our history calls a veritable baptism of the Holy Spirit. They knew God's presence by the fullness of forgiveness and peace and brotherly love which possessed them. Christian David wrote, it is truly a miracle of God that out of so many kinds and sects as Catholic, Lutheran, Reformed, Separatist, Gichtalian, you don't hear about that very often these days, and the like, we could have been melted into one. But listen to this. This is John Weinlich in his Zinzendorf biography. It is incorrect to assume that the Pentecostal experience of August 13, 1727, had put an end to all disunity in Hernhut. Deep religious experience does much to ease some of the ordinary frictions of living together, but it also creates areas of irritation which may not exist in the case of the unawakened. That is, Unlike those with no religious commitment, people of faith, including people committed to Christ and striving for the kingdom, will find themselves at odds with others who share their faith but have different ideas about its expression. 
If we were not committed, we would not care. But we do care. And sometimes the strength of our caring makes us think we must divide from those with whom we disagree. Is that what Jesus meant by, I come to bring division? If Jesus wanted that kind of division, why didn't the Holy Spirit just let the Herrenhut community divide? Can you imagine them declaring, Jesus came to bring division, and look how divided we are. What a success. So they might have congratulated each other had they been speaking to each other. But thanks be to God, with the Spirit's intervention, they united and surged forward as a community, and soon they were pushing past their boundaries into all the world. John Weinlich says that what allowed the Hernhut community to grow into the Moravian Church was that the Holy Spirit experience gave it sufficient momentum to handle its problems in stride. The fervor and energy of their work in subsequent years suggests that their momentum was a product of their Holy Spirit-renewed commitment. Commitment to Christ and now to one another. Life-changing, life-giving commitment. If we struggle with Christ preaching division, does it help to hear it as preaching commitment? Can we hear Jesus asking, are you committed to following me? Do you care about the coming of God's kingdom, a kingdom of justice and love? And if you do care, how are you showing it? How are you living your commitment? Because commitment to the kingdom is commitment to life. And how is life created? By division. One cell becomes two. Two cells become four, and so on. And yet all that division creates a unified organism. Isn't that a miracle? Every single time. Some division creates life. Some division kills. Divisions of suspicion and hatred and war. Which kind do you think Christ came to bring? In today's passage, Jesus says we know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky. When we look around the earth today, how do we interpret the deep divisions we're seeing as the coming of life or the coming of catastrophe? Would we really celebrate the division to which this nation has come as any sort of victory for Jesus Christ. The appearance of division is frightening, and the portents around us seem ominous. Yet what is the word of the Lord over and over throughout the scriptures? Do not be afraid. And when we are afraid anyway, because that's how we are, we can do what God told Abram to do in Genesis. The text Andrew preached on last week, count the stars. In that story, the stars represent God's ongoing promise to Abram, a promise, as Andrew said, of a future that God intends and makes possible, like the stars that are waiting to be born. You know how stars are born? By division. And the stronger your lens, the more division you can see, star giving birth to star, as you can see in those glorious images from the new Webb telescope. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, star differs from star in glory. Yet taken all together, all these divided and differing stars are a sign, as Andrew said last week, of just how big our God really is. When we commit to Jesus Christ, we commit to a vision of the kingdom. But trying to see the whole kingdom of God is like trying to see every star. Nobody can envision it all. 
Everyone's human vision of the kingdom necessarily falls short. But in the limitless space beyond our seeing, there's room for new visions, born every moment like the stars. Taken together, these visions of the kingdom present to our searching, hopeful eyes one undivided glory in the nighttime sky. Amen. Oh, at last we found our Savior. Let us sing. invites us to commitment. Commit your heart and everything else will follow. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we hear your call to commitment. We pray to follow. Bless these offerings that we give as a token of that commitment this day, and may our lives reflect our commitment in all ways for all days. Amen.
Join me now in a time of prayer for the church and for the world. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. We thank you for your presence among our ancestors and your continued presence with your church throughout the world. Renew and refresh the church. Drive us in prayer to Jesus and strengthen our commitment to Christ and to one another. Strengthen us to divide ourselves from that which impedes the kingdom and to unite across our diversity of opinion into unified service to Christ. We open our hearts now to your intervention. We pray especially for the people of Ukraine whose suffering is immense. We pray for an end to their suffering and an end to the depredations of brutal regimes around the world. Holy Spirit, the stories are too terrible for us to know what to pray. Intervene for us. Sigh and pray for those who are suffering. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. You are needed here. Be present here and in our hearts forever. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us stand.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever.